to our Lord. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Hello, everybody, and welcome back <coughs> to the Coptic class. Uh, I hope everybody had a, a good week. Um, let us uh, begin with our Coptic lesson. Um, so last time we learned about the Coptic vowels, um, the uh, alpha, e, e, tayuta, o, epsilon, u. There were seven vowel letters. And we started to read some like short phrases. Today we want to cover uh, the rule of the jinkim. Um, before we do that, let's uh, just review the letters very quickly. I'll say them for you, the letter and the pronunciation. <clears throat> so I have alpha, A, Vita, V or B, Ramma, G, GH or NG, Delta, Z or D, E, E, Su, Su, that's the number six, Zeta, Z, Eta, E, it's like the H, and uh, you can think of it as like two eyes with a dash, so it's a long E sound. Theta is the TH or T. Yota is I or Y. Kappa is K. Lulla is L. May is M. Ne, N. Xe, which looks like two Zs on top of each other, is the X sound or the KS sound. O is O, it's a short O, like oily or like not. P is the P sound, Rho is the R, Sima, S, Tav, T, Epsilon, we spend quite a bit of time on the Epsilon. So Epsilon has three ways, could be a V, if it follows an A or an E, it's a V. If it follows an O, it's another O, so you get a long O sound. And anything else, it is an E. Phi is F, or like the PH sound. Key is K most of the time, and then sometimes in some uh, Greek words, uh, it could be sh, the SH sound, like sherry, or it could be ch, the, the, like the ch sound, like Christus. Then we have ipsy, which looks like a harp. Psst, that's the ps, ps sound, like the, ps, like the psalms, like psalmos. U which is the W, is like an O-A sound, like, a, like an open A, like thok, like we say thok that you go. Shy is the S-H sound, sh, like shy. Phi is F. Chai is, is the Kha sound, like in Arabic, like chen, like we say jibin yotet chen nifi chen. Hori, which looks like a backwards S. This is the H sound, like nahrin, nahrin. Jinja is the G or the J sound. Chima, which looks, I, if you remember, I told you it looks like a, like a choo-choo train. So I'm, like this is the smoke coming out. So ch, ch, the TH sound or the TCH sound, ch, like choice or choice. And then T, <clears throat> this is two letters together. It's the T or the, like the top and the I together. Like so T, so T, okay. So now we learned all of the letters. In Coptic, there's an accent mark that is placed on, on the letters, and this is called the jinkim, the jinkim. So there are two rules for the jinkim. Uh, rule number one, if the jinkim comes over a vowel letter, you have to pronounce that letter by itself. So it's like it splits the word. So if we have um, a, uh, a jinkim on a vowel, like in this example here, we have a jinkim on this alpha. Alpha is a vowel. So this means we have to pronounce the, yeah, I mean, the, this word as three syllables. So we say a, a, rune, because this second a has a jinkim, so it's pronounced by itself. So we say a, a, rune, a, a, rune, which is Aaron, a, a, rune. Okay, let's get some volunteers to read some words here. Raise your hand if you want to volunteer. Okay, Thomas, go ahead. Maria. Ma Maria. Maria. Yes, good. Maria. 
which is Mary. Mary. And here again, like the A is pronounced by self, Mary. Good job, thank you. Gloria, the next word. Um, a vol. Good, a vol. You see how we pronounce the, the E by itself? A vol, a vol means of. Gloria, is uh, Philo with you? No. Okay. All right, next. Uh, Nadia, do you want to try the next one? Uh, Peck e tos. Peck e pos. Pos, I'm sorry. Peck e pos. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Peck e pos. So here again, the eta, because it's a vowel, has a jinkim, so we pronounce it by itself. Peck e pos. Peck means your. And a post is garden. So pick a post means your garden. Thank you. So that's the, the rule when it comes on a vowel. Now, if it comes on a consonant, so all of the other letters, we don't have to pronounce it by itself, but it puts like a small e sound in front of the letter. For example, if we have a jinkem on the top, we pronounce it it. On the kappa, it would be ik. On the may, m. On the N, N, Ed, Ev, Ez, Ech, Etch, Er. You get the idea, right? So you just put like a small E sound before the letter. So let's try to read a few words here. So I'll read the first one for you. So this is Ik is Maruot. We, we know this word like in the, the hem Ik is Maruot. So here we don't pronounce the, the letters by themselves, but we put like a small e sound. Ikes maru ot. Ikes maru ot. Okay. All right. So let's get some new, um, some more volunteers. Sue, do you want to do the next one? Yep. And and no. And no. And no. And Vita here at the end of the word, so it's a, a, a B. So in nob, in nob. Thank nob. you. Good. In nob, which means gold. Our nob means gold. In nob, the gold. By the way, Saint Abanub, Abanub, you know, everybody knows Saint Abanub. It means gold because it's the same word. Nob and Abanub is, is the same. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Heidi, do you want to try the next one? M Mariam. Yes, good. M Mariam. M Mariam. All right. So let's read a few more words here. Uh, Josie, do you want to try that next one? Um. The, the second letter, this is the F. F A E. F E. F E. So here the jink the jinkem is on the yota. Mm -hmm. So it's pronounced by itself. So F E. So why he would not say F A E? F A E. So we would have two vowels. Because you don't put an E sound before the yota, you just pronounce it by itself. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. You're right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So F no, good question. F E. F-E, good job. Thank you. Okay, Mina, Mina Y, you want to try the next one? Yeah, sure. Um, C-O to close. Yes, thank you. C-O here, again, the O has a jinkim, and O is a vowel, so we pronounce it by itself. So we have C-O to close, C-O to close. Okay, next one. Uh, Stas George, do you want to try the next one? Aaron. Yeah, Aaron. Aaron, yes, Aaron. Again, Jinkim. That's okay. Jinkim uh, on the vowels, so pronounce it by itself. So, Aaron. Good job. Thank you. Okay, next one. Let's see. Morel, do you want to try? Uh, 
P, good. And then this is E with a jinkim, so pronounce it by itself. So P, A. Ho, -u. there's there's three vowels here. So he, ho, this is the hoi and the o, so ho. And then the o and the epsilon is another two o's together, a long o. So p a ho u, p a ho u, p a ho u, which means the day. You know the, the hymn, alleluia fi pe, p a ho u. That's, this is the day, p a ho u. Good, thank you. Okay, we have a few more. Let's see. Uh, see Ham, do you want to try this one? E A E. Yeah, this is all is four <laughs> letters. They're all vowels. This is a, a tough one. So we have the E and the Yota together. So we have A, yeah. it's E A A, and then A and then E E. A A E E A E. We say this is also from a hymn. Alleluia A A E A A E. Good, thank you. Uh, Christina, do you want to try the next one? It's an easy one. Agios. Yes, Agios. Agios. A again by itself, and then uh, the the Agios. That's holy in Greek. And then the next one. Let's see who hasn't had a chance yet. Uh, the Gerges family, do you want to try this one? Um, this is the K. Cool. Ek, that has Jenkin, right? So it'd be Ek. Ek o, ek o web. Excellent. Ek o web, Ek o web, Ek o web, Ek o web. Also means holy, but in Coptic. So in Greek, agios, in Coptic, echo web. Gilgis, can I ask a question, please, about the, this, uh, the X, which is the She or the He or the K? Mm -hmm. Is there a rule like when do you know it's a K or a She? Or a... It's very hard to know when it's going to be a K, when it's going to be a She, when it's going to be a Ha. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for yeah, I mean, not to make it very complicated because the rules can get quite complicated, but just to give you yeah, I mean, the, the easy things to remember. Oh, and actually, I, I don't know how easy it will be, but if it's a Coptic word, it will be a K. So most of the time, it will be a K. If it's a Greek word, then it depends. Yeah, I mean, the, the word itself, yeah, yeah, you just have to know whether this is a Ha or a Sha. Like mm -hmm. Sherry, Sherry is Greek. Like we say Sherry ne Maria. We don't say right. Kerry ne Maria or Sherry ne Maria. So right. it's, it's a borrowed word. Christos, Christos bardo in Greek. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's a K, sorry, it's mm -hmm. a Ha. But most of the time, yani, if, if you don't know and you have to guess, you, you mm -hmm. can guess that it's a K and most of the time that will be the right answer. Okay, thank you so much. Sure, sure, okay. The next one, let's see, Ramon, oh, his audio is, is your audio working yet? Okay, uh, we have Mina. Mina, do you wanna try this word? Yes. Idrias. Idrias, yes, but then we have the T in front of it, right? Oh yeah, sorry. It, 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 I was saying it did read, sorry. Yeah, T, it, re, yes. T, the now you see the difference between the T and the top. So the T is a T-E, right? So T and then it, re, yes. T, it, re, yes, which means the Trinity. Thank you. Oh, 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 a great question. Yes, so in So in terms of involved, I know yes. that it said it said equals. Uh, I know that it said evo means 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 of, but but on the other hand, also it means sense. So how do we know when to say of and sense? Usually, I mean, just evo by itself uh, is of evolchen. 
can be like within or so it, it depends also on on the context and even of is not a hundred percent accurate translation of the word because it could be used in different things like you said so it could mean of it could mean since it could mean within um so uh, that's one of those words that is that has multiple uses okay well that's true thank you mina no problem Okay, the next one, uh, let's see, we have Michael Woodrow. Do you want to try? In day. Yeah, it's very easy. In te. In te is very easy. It's N with a shinkim, so N and then T E in te. The next one is a big word, so I want to see volunteers who want to try this one. Can I try it? Sure. Epres uh, v v t v t ros. Good, good, excellent. Epres v Teros, Epres V Teros. Even the E uh, and the, the Epsilon, yani the, the E pronunciation is just a little bit different between the two, right? So Epres V Teros, Epres V Teros, which is the Presbyters, the priest, Presbyters. Okay, next one. Uh, okay, we go easy, right? back. Uh, Daniel, Daniel hasn't said one yet. Daniel? Yeah, Ephron, good. Ephron, we say what? Chen Ephron, in the name, Chen Ephron, good. One more, uh, Gloria. Gloria? Yeah. The last one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Ship Ehmut, Ship Ehmut, good. Ship Ehmut, which means thank you. Okay, we have a few more. I think this may be the last slide. Um, Thomas? Apostolos. Good. Apostolos, Apostolos, which is apostle. Good job. Uh, See, uh, Lauren, Lauren, you haven't said one. Do you want to try? Okay, uh, Mina, why do you want to try? Yeah, sure. Elisos. Yes. Uh, Alithos, Alithos, means truly, like we say, Christos Anesti, Alithos Anesti, he is, uh, Christ is risen, truly he is risen. Okay, next one. Uh, let's see, has everybody said? Okay. Um, Mr. George, do you want to do the next one? P. No, I'm not sure. Okay, that's okay. Uh, somebody. P -O -O? Yeah. P -O -O? yeah, this is another difficult one, Alashan. Actually, it's all vowels, just uh, the P, yeah. but the, the rest are all vowels. And we break it down. So the P and the Yota is P, P. Right. And then the U is P, O, and then the O, Epsilon, U. P, O, U, P, O, U, which means the glory, P, O, U. Okay. Next one, very easy one. I think all of us can say this. Yeah. Amin, 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 Amin. And the lesson is finished, Amin. <laughs> 
so um, now yani we learned the, the jinkim. The jinkim, if it comes on a vowel, um, you pronounce the vowel by itself, like a ah, mean, like this. But if it comes on a consonant, you put like a small e sound before the letter. So this is the rule of the jinkim. And we find when we start reading yani, the Coptic text, we'll find a lot of jinkims on many, many words. So it's important for us to know how to uh, correctly pronounce uh, the jinkim. Okay, let's um, talk today. Um, last time in the rites, we talked about the rites of the Kiak praises. And um, if, if, yani, we, we went through the, the structure of, of the praises. We went through the four hoses. If you remember, what was the first host? Who can, who can uh, remind us? The first host was about what? Moses. Moses. Moses crossing the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. And then the second host is about what? Thanksgiving. The Thanksgiving. Very good. And then the third host? The three young men. And the fourth host? Uh, the creation, the moon, the sun. Exactly. So we have going through the water. Which, was the, which is the praise of Moses the prophet and coming out alive and then giving thanks to God. So um, then the, that's the second host taken from Psalm 136. And then the third host is the, the prayer or the praise of the three young men in the fiery furnace. And then the fourth host is the last three Psalms, Psalm 148, 149, and 150, which is the, 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 the praise of the whole creation, that the whole creation praises God. And then after the four hosts, we said that we have the commemoration of the saints. And after the commemoration, we begin the psali. Psali is a song um, about the Lord and specifically praising the name of the Lord. After, and there's a psali, one for each day. And then after the psali, we have the theotokeia. The theotokeia, from the word theotokos, which means mother of God, theotokeia is a glorification for the Theotokos, or a glorification for the mother of God. And we, we said that all the, again, there's one for each day. So there are seven Theotokeias. And all of them speak about, you know, um, symbolisms uh, that, that point to the Theotokos. And we touched on the Sunday Theotokeia. And we said that the Sunday Theotokeia specifically talks about the tabernacle and how uh, it resembles um, the Theotokos. So today we're gonna continue talking about that and just you know, dive a little bit deeper into the tabernacle and how the tabernacle uh, represents um, the Theotokos. So first of all, what is like, what's the tabernacle? Uh, you know, can somebody tell me what the tabernacle is, Thomas? The tabernacle is like, I think it's like the altar back then for like the temple. Okay. Uh, Gloria? House of God. Yes, good, good. Gloria, you also raised your hand. You want to add? Tabut al-Ahad. Tabut al-Ahad is inside. So Tabut al-Ahad is the Ark of Covenant. The tabernacle is the, the whole tent, Khimt al So what's the story? Yani very, very uh, quickly. When the people left Egypt and they went into the wilderness, when Moses took the people out of Egypt and went into the wilderness, so God ordered him to build a tabernacle, to build a tent. So uh, all the people were living in tents. And so God wanted to live with his people. So they were living in tents. So he also wanted to live in a tent. So this is the tent, that, which is called the tabernacle. And as you see in the picture here, this very large structure, this is the tabernacle. We'll, we'll talk about it and we'll explain you know, the different parts of it. But you see all around the tabernacle, these are all the tents of the Israelites. How many tribes were there? Uh, three. Twelve. No, twelve, twelve. Twelve, twelve, twelve tribes. So in the four corners or the four sides, there's three tribes in each side. And God is in the middle of the people. So this is the first 
thought or the first understanding that the tabernacle is a place where God dwells among his people. As the Lord said to Moses in Exodus 25, he said, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And also in Exodus 29, he says, I will dwell among the children of Israel and will be their God and they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Okay, so the point is God wants to dwell among his people. St. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So this, this is the whole point that God he wants to dwell among his people. So at the beginning, the tabernacle, as we said, was among the people, right exactly in the center. When the people started to, to sin and, and, and walk away from God, and after many, you know, many um, sins and many times that you know, they, they, they keep making bigger mistakes and bigger mistakes. So then God told Moses to take the tabernacle and put it outside of the camp. So in the picture here, you see, if we, let me just remove the words so you can see easier. So we see here that the tabernacle is in the middle. That means what? That means everybody has access to God. Everybody can walk out of his tent and he can see the tabernacle and he knows that God is there. And the tabernacle always had the cloud of fire on top of it at night and the cloud, uh, the pillar of cloud in the daytime. So even if you wake, wake up in the middle of the night and you're scared or worried or, or stressed out, you walk outside your camp and you see the, the, the pillar of fire and you know that God is, is there, so you, you get comforted. When the people kept on sinning, now the tabernacle was taken outside of the camp because God said, I cannot dwell among these people anymore. So now there's separation. So what happened? The people, because of their sins, separated themselves from God. Now people have to make an extra effort to go to God. At the beginning, it was easy. God was right there. You just walk out of your tent and God is right there. Now, after the sin, God is, is, is a little bit far. You have to make an effort. You have to get out of the camp. You have to walk out into, you know, this, 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 this camp is huge, right? All of these tents everywhere. You can see as, you know, how far it is. So now to go to God, you have to make an extra effort. So this is, the, the idea here is that sin separates us from God. And if we want to stay close to God, we need to separate ourselves from sin before sin separates us from God. So the first point, as we said, is that the, the, the tabernacle, that God wants to dwell among his people. So what is the tabernacle? What, Yanni, what does it uh, give Hello? us? Or what? Yes. Okay. What does it give us? So the tabernacle is a symbol of the presence of the incarnate God, the presence of God. As I said, people look at it, they see the pillar of fire, they know that God is there. And it was, it was in the middle of the 12 tribes, as we said. When Moses went into the tabernacle, all the people stood at the door of, of their tents. What does this mean? First of all, Moses was the only one allowed to go inside the inner part of the tabernacle. Um, and God spoke to Moses. God spoke to Moses, you know, from the Ark of Covenant that is inside the tabernacle. So he communicated with him. So anytime Moses went to the tabernacle, that means God is getting, has a message. So when people saw Moses go into the tabernacle, they all stood. What, what does it mean that they stood? That means they're ready. They are uh, at attention, you know, like in the military. They are anxious. They want to see what God wants. What is the message that God's going to give them? Are they going to move from the camp and go somewhere else? Are they going to stay? Is God happy with them? Is God upset with them? Did they do something wrong? Did they do something right? So anytime Moses went to speak to God, the people stood and waited. And then Moses would come out and then he would tell them the message that God gave him to tell the people. The tabernacle was a testimony of the glory of God. 
and it was a place um, to which the people can come to worship and to feel close to God, which is today, this is the church. So the tabernacle was a foreshadow of the church. Who designed the tabernacle? God himself designed it. He's the one who told Moses exactly how to build the tabernacle, all the measurements, how, what to make, how, how to make it. Um, like when we, and we can study in more depth the tabernacle later, but today we just want to get an idea and kind of the symbolism. But we will see that God tells him, you make the ark like this and you make rings in it um, to put poles in it so that you can carry it around. And it's made out of uh, you know, a specific kind of wood and overlaid with gold. And you make a cover for everything, all the details, all the details. So God is the architect. He's the designer of the, um, of the tabernacle and all its articles. And he's the one who dictated the rites. How do you worship inside the tabernacle? How do you offer sacrifices? How do you offer incense? How do you light the lamps? How often, when? How do you put the, the showbread? All of these things God put together. So the tabernacle was also a copy of heaven. The tabernacle is a copy of heaven. Um, in Exodus chapter 26, we read, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy. So, in Hebrews chapter 9, St. Paul explains to us, and he says, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, because Christ did not enter the tabernacle that Moses made, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God, for us. So the tabernacle was a copy, a foreshadow of heaven. And when we learn more about the tabernacle, we will see that only the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies only once a year and with a very specific rite. And he has to have blood with him and he has to have incense with him. So all of these were symbols about the crucifixion that Christ came. And he, he offered himself as a sacrifice, and he only did it one time. And with the blood, with his own blood, he was able to, to save. So all of these were um, symbols of, as we said, the sacrifice and symbols of the heaven. If you want to understand the tabernacle, you have to read Hebrews chapter 5. He, uh, so, sorry, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews 9 explain to, explains to us what the tabernacle is. So where is the tabernacle today? We said that the tabernacle was a shadow of heaven. So therefore, the true tabernacle is in heaven. We read this in Revelation chapter 11 and chapter 15. St. John saw in, in the Revelation in heaven, he said, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the Ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. So the Ark of Covenant, the true Ark of Covenant, is in heaven. After these things, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. So again, all of this was a shadow of heaven. So this is what the tabernacle looks like. This is like a, uh, a model. Okay, you see there's uh, uh, like a, a large gate or fence all around it. And then you see here, there's a big altar. And you see here, there's like um, a big, like pool we'll explain what these things are and then you see like a, a, an inner house here okay so we'll let's let's explain these things in the tabernacle everything is in threes okay everything is in threes so the parts of the tabernacle there are three parts of the tabernacle we have the holy of holies or the most holy this is that that house that I showed you in the back, the, the inner part of it is called the Holy of Holies, this part here. And then there's a veil, and then there is the Holy, this out, outer part. So you have the Holy of Holies separated by a veil from the Holy. And then outside, you have the outer court, this part out here outside of this, uh, of this inner tent. 
this veil, do you remember when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and when he died on the cross, what happened? The veil of the temple was torn, right? The temple of Solomon, it was built exactly like the tabernacle. So this veil here that separates the holy from the holy of holies, this is the veil that was broken when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, okay? The Holy of Holies, this is the inner part. I told you everything is in threes, right? So the Holy of Holies has three things in it. It has the Ark of Covenant. This is the Ark of Covenant here. And on top of it, this cover, it's called the Mercy Seat. So two things here. We have the Ark of Covenant and then the Mercy Seat on top of it. And then we have the Golden Censer, right? So three things in the Holy of Holies, the Ark of Covenant, the Mercy Seat, and the Golden Censer. Pay attention to these things because I'm going to ask you about them at the end. I'm giving you a hint of what the questions are going to be. Outside of the Holy of Holies, we have the Holy. How many things are in the Holy? Three. three. Everything is in three. So we have what is called the table of showbread. This is a picture of it here. So it's a table that has bread on it. This bread looks like the orban that we, that we use in the church today. And there are 12 loaves like the 12 tribes of Israel. And there's incense on top of it and very, you know, wonderful things. Uh, again, one, you know, we'll, we'll study these things later in, in more detail. And then we have the golden lampstand. The golden lampstand, it has seven lamps. You know, around Christmas time, the Jews, they celebrate Hanukkah, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have a lampstand that has seven uh, seven lamps. You see this mm -hmm. like in the windows. That's it's based off of this golden lampstand. And then there's the altar of incense. There's the altar of incense. So three things in the holy, the table of showbread, the golden lampstand, and the altar of incense. Then we go outside. So we, we went from the in, inner to the outer. So outside is the outer court. Again, there are three things. We have the altar of sacrifices, this huge altar that we saw in the picture. And then remember, I told you there's like a pool there that's called the bronze laver. It's, it's made out of bronze and it's like a big washing uh, basin that they wash their hands and, and their feet in it. And then the gate, the entrance to the, to the tabernacle. So the outer court has three things, has the altar of sacrifices, the bronze laver and the gate. So now we, we take a, a, pic, a look at the picture again. Let's start from the out, out, outer into the inner. So we go through the gate, this is the gate, and then we see the altar of sacrifices, this huge altar here. And then beyond the altar of sacrifices, we have the bronze laver. I'll just give you a hint. After they offer the sacrifices, then they go wash their hands in the bronze laver. So when they offer sacrifices, what do they have on their hand? When you offer a sacrifice, you're going to get what Blood. on your hand? Blood. Blood. And mm -hmm. then you go to the bronze laver and you wash your hands in water. So now what happens? What's in the laver? Water. Water and? Blood. Blood. Yeah. So does, what does that remind us of? Jesus? Yes. It reminds me. The, the, uh, the side of Jesus Christ when he was pierced. Mm -hmm. Blood yes. came out with water. The whole tabernacle represents the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk about that another time. But um, I just want to give you a hint of how you, you can start to see what the tabernacle really means. So... We go through the gate, we see the altar of sacrifices, we see the bronze laver, then we go into the, the inner uh, tent, and we have first the holy. The holy has three things. It has the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the lampstand, and then there's a veil. We go through the veil, we go into the uh, inner um, holy of holies, which also has three things, which is the Ark of Covenant, and the cover for it, which is the mercy seat and the golden um, uh, sensor. Okay. So that's the layout of the tabernacle. Now, what does the tabernacle represent? We already mentioned these things. So it represents heaven, right? The tabernacle is a copy of heaven. 
we talked about that already. We also said that the tabernacle is uh, the church or represents the church, right? The people used to go there to pray, to, to, to ask for God's help, to worship God, just like we do in the church today. And I already gave you a hint that the tabernacle also represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And also the tabernacle represents the mother of God, the Theotokos. And that's what we are going to focus on uh, for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Another time, we can talk about the symbolism of the tabernacle uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. That will be a very uh, interesting uh, um, topic as well. So how does the tabernacle um, represents the Theotokos. And again, in the Sunday Theotokia, which we are you know, praying during Kiak, and actually every, every Saturday night, but especially because during Kiak, more people attend the Kiak praises. So I wanted to take this time to explain this. So how does the, Theotok how does the tabernacle represent the Theotokos, the mother of God? We'll take a few examples because everything represents the Theotokos, and we won't have time to explain every article, but we'll just take a few examples. So the Ark of Covenant, the Ark of Covenant. Um, the Ark of Covenant is made of acacia wood. What is acacia wood? Acacia wood is wood that does not decay. It's wood that does not decay. What does that mean? How, how does that represent the mother of God? The Theotokos is pure. She's unblemished and undefiled. She was a virgin before giving birth to the Lord. She was a virgin during the birth and she was a virgin after giving the birth. So she's, that's why we call her the ever virgin. She's always pure, she's always undefiled. Um, the church fathers said that, why did it take such a long time for the Lord Jesus to come and, and, be, uh, and become incarnate? It took almost 6,000 years. And they said, because he was waiting for somebody who was pure enough, who was very pure, was very unblemished, undefiled, that he can be born of. And that was St. Mary. And, you know, that was the due time. That was the time when she was born. Um, the, the, the Ark of Covenant was overlaid with gold, covered with gold within and without. So it's made out of wood and uh, acacia wood, and then it's covered with gold. Gold represents something very valuable, very precious, very exalted. Just like the Theotokos, she is very exalted, she's very precious. We exalt her. You know, we, we say in the chant during Kiahkwat, we exalt you uh, worthily with Elizabeth, your cousin, right? So the Ark of Covenant represents the Theotokos and that it's undefiled, it's pure, like it's made up wood that does not decay and then covered with gold means it's very precious, very valuable, very expensive. Inside the Ark of Covenant are three things. Remember, everything is, is in three. So inside the Ark of Covenant, there are three things. You can see them here in this, in this model. It has the pot of manna, this, this small thing here. So this it looks like a cup or a bowl, and there's like little dots in it. Of course, this is a miniature model, um, but these dots represent the manna. What is the manna? The manna is the bread that came down from heaven when the people were hungry. So it's the bread of heaven. Who is the bread of heaven? Who is the bread that came down from heaven? Jesus. Very easy. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. So if what's inside the pot is the body of Christ, then who is the pot? St. Mary. St. Mary, who carried the Lord Jesus Christ. Very, this is a very easy symbolism, right? So the manna is, represents the body of Christ, and the pot represents the womb of St. Mary, who carried the manna, who carried the Lord Jesus Christ. We also have here the rod of Aaron, the rod of Aaron. What happened to the rod of Aaron? Why is it in the tabernacle? So at one point, the people started to murmur against Moses and against Aaron. And they said, why does Aaron and Moses have to be the leaders? We are all God's people. And why can't any of us be leaders, right? And there were three people 
who were leading this rebellion. And so God told Moses, take their staffs and take the staff of Aaron and put them all in front of me on top of the Ark of Covenant. So he took all of these staffs, these rods, and he put them on the Ark of Covenant. And then what happened? The staff of Aaron, it started to give life. It blossomed and gave fruit, and it's almond, almond fruit, without being planted and without being watered. So Moses did not take the staffs, and he did not put them in the ground and start watering them. And then after a month or so, no. This happened overnight. A dead piece of wood, a piece of wood that cannot give life, by definition, it is a broken staff, right? It's you know, taken from a tree and, and broken from that tree, and it's been dead for years. That's how he can use it as a staff. So it cannot give life, but it gave life. So this is a miracle. This is something mysterious. It cannot be explained. Just like who? The Theotokos, the, the womb of Saint Mary, it cannot give life because she was a virgin. So she cannot, she cannot give, have any children, but miraculously and with a mystery that we cannot understand, she gave life. And so that was a sign from God that the chosen one is Aaron. And so then the, the rest of the people were punished. Um, but that's not the story that we wanna focus on. We want to focus on that the staff of Aaron, the leader, the priest is what gave life. So the rod of Aaron resembles the Theotokos and also resembles the priesthood, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the third thing in the Ark of Covenant is the tablets of the covenant, the two tablets that have the Ten Commandments written on them. So what are the Ten Commandments? They are the word of God, right? Mm -hmm. So who is the word of God? The Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. So if the word of God is contained in the Ark of Covenant, so then who is the Ark of Covenant? The mm -hmm. one who carried the word of God, the Theotokos. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. You understand now? Mm -hmm. Yes. So now we understand the Ark of Covenant, how it resembles St. Mary. What about the cover on top of the Ark of Covenant, which is called the mercy seat, the mercy seat? So the mercy seat, as, as you see in the picture here, it was the cover, and it was over, overshadowed by two cherubim, as you see here, two cherubim, and they are spreading their wings, like you see in the picture, and they are bowing, they're looking down, okay? So they are worshiping, worshiping who? God, who is in the tabernacle, in the, in the ark, or represented by the ark. And if we said that the Ark of Covenant also represents the Theotokos, the mother of God, so then the mercy seat also represents the mother of God, and she's overshadowed by all the angels. Um, and these angels were praising the Lord while he was in her womb. So I can imagine, I know it's not written in, in the Bible anywhere, but I can imagine that while she was pregnant, with the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and, and also after she gave birth to him, she heard many, many praises from the angels. You know, can you imagine if the king of any country, right? <clears throat> Let's say the king of England, for example, um, if he takes a trip and he goes somewhere, he goes to visit, uh, I don't know, he goes to visit Africa. What are the soldiers doing? Are they just sitting home and like, you know, playing football or are they going with him? right? They're going with him and they're always attending to him and seeing if he needs anything and always, you know, praising him and, and taking care of him and taking care of the people who are taking care of him. So the same thing, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, came down into the womb of St. Mary. So it is very, uh, you know, it's a given that she was surrounded by angels all the time. Even if, even if she didn't see them all the time, they were there all the time. They were always praising um, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, if, if St. Mary had written down for us all the praises that she heard, uh, we, I mean, those praises probably would have overwhelmed us by, by all the beautiful hymns that the angels were, 
were chanting um, while uh, she was carrying the Lord Jesus Christ. We said also that inside of the Holy of Holies, all of these things are inside the Holy of Holies. <clears throat> we also have the golden censer, right? As you see in the picture here, the censer uh, at the bottom. And here we see the high priest, Aaron, and we see he has a, a plate with him and you see on his hands, there's blood. So this is when he enters into the Holy of Holies once a year to offer this sacrifice. And there's a very nice ritual. He has to put the blood in, in a very specific way um, all over the tabernacle, all over the Ark of Covenant. And this, then God would lift his anger from the people. So the golden censer, and, and he brought the censer with him and he offered incense while he's doing you know, this, this rite. So the golden censer is again made of pure gold. And we already said that gold represents you know, something that is uh, expensive, that is exalted, but also represents something that's pure because it's made out of pure gold. And <clears throat> the censer carried the live coal, okay? And this coal was taken from the altar, the altar of incense, which was, where, where, where's the altar? Let's see, let's see who's paying attention. Where's the altar of incense? The altar of incense is in the holy area. Yes. So this means that the high priest took coal from on top of the altar of incense with, with tongues, and, and he put it into the golden censer and he brought it into the Holy of Holies. What does this, this rite mean? This coal, we already know, and we talked about this before uh, when we talked about the censer, um, the coal represents the, the, the humanity, but the fire inside the coal represents the divinity. So this is the incarnate God. And it's taken from the altar. What do we offer an altar? We offer sacrifice. So that means that this was a sacrifice. This is the cross. So the altar of incense represents the cross. And he brings it into the Holy of Holies when he is offering this, you know, this rite of, of, uh, of atonement to offer redemption. So what does this mean? It means that Christ, the one who was crucified on the cross is the one who gave us redemption and he's the one who saved us from our sins. God, the word who took flesh from the Theotokos, from St. Mary, offered himself as incense to God, his father, and he offered us um, uh, salvation. So coal represents Christ, Gilgis? Yes, the coal represents Christ. The coal, uh, the coal has like, it, there's two things. There's the, uh, just the, it, the, the coal itself represents the humanity, the human nature. Okay. But when we ignite the coal with fire, it doesn't burn the coal and it doesn't separate from the coal. So we have a new nature. This nature is a live coal. We cannot separate the coal from the fire anymore. Mm. The fire represents the divinity of Christ. So together, the, the live coal represents the, 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 you know, the incarnate God because he, he is God and he took flesh and became, you know, one nature which has both the divinity and the humanity. Thank you. If we step outside of the Holy of Holies and, and go outside into the Holy, we said there are three things. There's the altar of incense, we already touched on it. There's the table of showbread and there's the golden lampstand. We'll talk about the golden lampstand. The golden lampstand also made of pure gold. We already talked about gold and what it represents. But the golden lampstand always had fire on it. Always, you know, they, they never turned off the, um, uh, the, the, the lamps. The seven lamps, they had to always be on morning and evening. And so this fire or this lamp or this light was ever burning, which means what? Christ is the light of the world. And he gave light to us right? And he enlightened our way. He guided our feet in the path of peace, as we say in the Theotokia. We who were in the, in, the, uh, in the darkness and the shadow of death, he guided our feet into the path of peace. 
who carried the light? Who Saint carried? Mary. Yeah, Saint Mary. So mm -hmm. now we see. Now we're beginning to understand how all of these things help us understand uh, the you know the, the Theotokos. Um, so the golden lampstand itself is also a symbol of the Theotokos, Saint Mary. The tabernacle, the whole tabernacle represents the presence of God, as we said, and the whole tabernacle represents the Theotokos. I told you everything resembles the Theotokos, but I just took some examples to give you, you know, some flavor. In the Sunday Theotokia, we chant and we say, you are called righteous, O blessed one. We're talking to Saint Mary. Among women, the second tabernacle. They likened it to you, O Virgin Mary, the true tabernacle wherein dwelt God. So if the whole tabernacle represents the incarnate God, the incarnate Lord Jesus Christ, St. Mary is the true tabernacle where the Lord Jesus Christ dwelt. So she carried him in her womb. So the whole tabernacle also represents the Virgin St. Mary. And she is the second tabernacle, because the first tabernacle is the tabernacle that we're talking about here, which carried the word of God to the people, but the people did not understand, and they, they, they didn't appreciate it. That's why Moses had to take it outside of the camp, because people, God dwelt among them, and they still didn't appreciate it. But the second tabernacle, the true tabernacle, is Saint Mary who brought to us um, God the Word. That's why when, when the angel spoke to her, he told her he shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, because when she brought God, he became with us. Emmanuel, I told you this in the Coptic lesson, I think last time. Emmanuel, il means God. Emmanuel means among or with. So Emmanuel is God with us. So the Virgin Mary gave us the Lord Jesus Christ and he dwelt among us and we beheld him. And that's why in the Tazbeha, in the, in the midnight praises and especially in the Theotokias, we always honor the Virgin Saint Mary. And as we saw here in the Sunday Theotokia that we chant on Saturday night, um, when, when now we understand, we see that the Virgin Saint Mary is the Theo, is the tabernacle, and that's why we chant about the tabernacle in the Sunday Theotokia. And glory be to God forever, Amen. Um, any questions about uh, about this?